Hello, and welcome to our very first autism webinar um, for uh, that I've ever done. And this is Autism Awareness Month for April, and it's very exciting. My name is uh, Dr. Josh Smith, and uh, let me tell you a little bit about why we're doing this. Um, Autism of suicide has had a very uh, important impact on my family. And every year we walk in the out of darkness walk uh, to raise money for suicide awareness. And this year, my son Eli is uh, raising money and he wanted to figure out a way to raise money. So he decided that I could teach about autism. And if it was helpful, people could donate to his page. So, uh, yes, uh, Gonzalo, I am more than willing to sing. I may even sing in Spanish. Um, so we, uh, uh, we have set this up where I will do an autism video, um, every, um, uh, Wednesday at nine o'clock. And uh, if you find it helpful, uh, click on the link um, listed and donate, oh, donate something to the cause. And we would really appreciate it. Um, now, autism has also been something that has significantly affected our family. Uh, my, I have four children and my two oldest, Caitlin and Jared, are autistic. And it was quite the journey for us. So let me tell you a, a little bit about myself. I have an undergraduate degree from uh, Utah State University. And I received both my uh, master's and doctorate degree from Spalding University, the Fighting Pelicans. And... Uh, while the time I was going through graduate school was the time that my daughter, Caitlin, was diagnosed with autism. Now, for me, I had a lot of advantages because I was in a graduate school studying clinical psychology, and I had access to professors and other information that was very helpful. Not everybody else is so lucky. Um, so that really helped me know what I needed to know and uh, find the resources necessary for Caitlin. And also uh, eventually when my son Jared was diagnosed with autism, I, um, uh, I did my uh, internship at Jewish family services in Richmond, Virginia. And uh, I have um, worked with autistic patients at our lady of peace hospital and with autistic inmates for the Kentucky corrections uh, systems. And so you would think that there wouldn't be autistic prison inmates, but there are, unfortunately. And so um, I learned a lot by doing that process. I have done uh, behavioral health um interventions in, uh, in the home base setting. And now I have my own private practice in New Albany, which I love, where I do individual family and group therapy. But with all of those things, the thing that I have learned the most uh, about autism has come from helping my own children. And I really help uh, to pass that on to you all. Uh, if you all have any questions, feel free to uh, put them in there and I will try to answer them to the best of my ability, either in this session or in upcoming sessions. Um, the, uh, today we will be talking about identifying signs of autism and then also autism assessment. And if you have any ideas for f future topics, please let me know. I was thinking about call, uh, talking about intervention, resources, and 
uh, behavioral modification are some of the things that I'd like to talk in upcoming uh, webinars. Also, just as one final thing, uh, we have a special uh, hoodie for the uh, suicide awareness uh, that's uh, available for, it's an, a large hoodie and it's available uh, for kind of like a drawing out of those who've donated. So with all that being said, um, let's talk about identifying autism, which is not easy. I remember when my daughter Caitlin was born, I'll never forget it. It uh, uh, was LeBron James' first professional basketball game. And um, I remember holding Caitlin uh, and, you know, Emily was asleep and I can understand while I've never delivered a baby, it looks painful from what I can tell. And so, you know, the woman deserved to rest. And so Caitlin and I were watching basketball and um, she was perfect, absolutely perfect in every way. And um, as um, you go along and you raise children, you realize that they have their own unique personalities. And um, Caitlin definitely had her own unique personality. Uh, the girl ran at nine months. She took like one step and then ran. Uh, the girl has always been physically gifted. And one of the things about raising children is you always are monitoring how they grow and develop. And we uh, noticed that Caitlin didn't talk much, but we thought, well, she's so physically gifted, it would be uh, obvious that she would catch up with everybody else. And um, we, th things kept going along, and it wasn't until somebody at church noticed that Caitlin wasn't acting in a way that other children um, would typically act her age, and they asked, they recommended, this person recommended that we get her tested. And I remember being so ticked off. How could uh, how could anybody say that about my daughter? Plus, I am a in training to be a psychologist. I would know if there was something wrong with my daughter. And I remember going to sleep angry that night. And um, um, I woke up and I thought, well, we'll get her tested, and that will prove this person wrong. And then they will know that there was no reason for um, anybody to ever think that there was anything wrong with Caitlin. And we arranged to get her tested. And I remember she was tested at Riley's Children's Hospital in Indianapolis, which is an excellent place to get testing done. And one of the advantages of that is they allow you to um, – watch the children as they're completing the testing with a psychologist through a one-way mirror and they had headphones so you could hear um, what is uh, being said. And within a few minutes of Caitlin being tested, I thought, oh, she's autistic. And that's when it hit me. And... Now, looking back on it, I am so grateful for the person at church who told us that there could be something wrong with Caitlin because the, by far the best thing that you can do for children with autism is get intervention as early as possible. And this allowed Caitlin to receive intervention early. Um, the earliest you can make a diagnosis for autism is 18 months. Um, now, there is some new research that is coming out, and they believe within the next couple of years they will be able to do blood and urine tests to determine autism, which would be outstanding. It would put some friends of mine out of a job, but other than that, it would be outstanding because diagnoses could happen within a year 
so at the year mark, meaning er even earlier intervention, and uh, there would be no subjective nature of the diagnoses. People could accept it for what it is. Um, so that's exciting. Uh, there has been research now that's has shown that trained psychologists can recognize signs of autism in children at a year, at at the age of a year. But until that point, there's uh, really uh, nothing that you can do diagnosis-wise until 18 months. So what are the things that parents should be concerned about? Well, the biggest thing that you're going to want to look for is eye contact. Even young infants should show some amount of eye contact when a person is talking to the infant. And it could be very clear early on into um, an infant's life whether or not they're having eye contact. Second, and this is the first big word of the day, uh, emotional reciprocity, which basically means that they are matching your emotions. If you smile in front of a baby, does the baby smile back? If you frown, does the baby frown? Um, these, this gives you a big indicator if there is some level of concern. Vocabulary development is an important thing to look at, but not the only important thing. Um, because, for example, 25% of American children go to some level of speech therapy. So it is possible that someone goes to speech therapy early on, and then you would never know as an adult that they were had any kind of intervention. So you're going to look for those things, and then you're going to also look for what we call atypical movements. And these are rhythmic behaviors that an individual will do uh, in response to overstimulation. So my son Jared, he's a flapper. He flaps when he's excited, which is cool. Uh, you'll see a lot of different other things, strange finger movements, head movements, things like that are atypical. Um, you're going to want to consult with the pediatrician about uh, all these considerations. Now, one thing that I can tell you is research has shown there is no negative side effect to having a child tested. The only thing that's going to be affected is it's going to take some time and maybe some money, but at least you'll know. And if a child is tested and it turns out they don't have autism, there is no negative effect for having the testing done. So it's always better to have the testing done. Now, one of the more difficult uh, work experiences I had was what, while I was intern for Jewish Family Services. And one of the things that I was required to do is consult at the Jewish preschool. And I was asked to um, uh, go to the preschool, sit in with children who the uh, teachers were concerned about, and see if I saw that there were concerns about developmental functioning and then meet with the parents to recommend testing. And I have to tell you, some of those meetings did not go well. Uh, many of these people were well off, influential people, and an intern was telling them that there was something wrong with their child. And uh, quite a few people refused to have their children tested which is unfortunate. Um, and some of those people didn't end up apologizing at the end of the year because they did recognize uh, that there were concerns for their children, but it just ended up wasting time where the child could have received intervention earlier. So I always recommend testing if there is a concern. Um, 
let's talk about testing. Now, in the Louisville, Southern Indiana area, there is not good places to get testing done. It's better in Louisville. It is horrible in Southern Indiana, especially for individuals on Medicaid. Um, and unfortunately, a number of agencies are diagnosing children with autism without pop proper assessment. And there are thousands of issues wrong with this, but let's go with a few. So first, when you are testing somebody for autism, there are a few things that you want to rule out first. First is whether there's any hearing disruption. A person who is hearing impaired may look a little autistic, probably because they can't hear what people are saying. Um, so uh, there are ways for hearing tests to be done um, with nonverbal children, and it, it's, a, it's a great rule out to determine if that's an issue. Second, uh, it is essential that lead testing be done because excessive uh, uh, amounts of lead in children can lead to the child showing autistic-like symptoms. And it's a very simple test and one that should be done every time it could be done at your pediatrician's office. I remember I was asked to consult on one case um, where um, the uh, individual was having a hard time eating. And in addition, was nonverbal and I was told was severely autistic. So I was doing home-based work at this time. And so the, e the easiest way to figure out what's going on is to be there when the eating is occurring. So I showed up at dinner time and uh, the mom is there setting the table and I um, see that she is passing out these wonderfully decorative, colorful plates. And I happened to comment on these plates and I said, oh, these are amazing plates. Where did you get them? And she's like, oh, I got them from Mexico. Now, I served my Mormon mission in South America. So I know that sometimes plates and, and other eating utensils in uh, Central and South America have lead in them, unfortunately. And so when uh, the um, um, uh, I asked the mom, I was like, when your son was uh, diagnosed with autism, did they ever do a lead test? And she's like, no. And uh, I was, I suggested that they get lead testing done. And it turns out that the child did have excessive lead in his body from the plates that the mother had purchased. And they, there was actually a simple treatment to help counteract uh, the, the lead poisoning. Also removal of the plates. And uh, the child was speaking in full paragraphs, eating just fine uh, after that. Um, so that's just one example of a thorough assessment being done. Uh, one of the reasons why it's so hard uh, to get appropriate testing done is because many of the uh, organizations in this area, especially Southern Indiana, do not have clinicians trained to do the proper testing. Uh, so the, um, uh, the gold standard for autistic testing is a, an assessment called the ADOS. Now, the ADOS is a wonderful test. And I will tell you, I am not trained in doing the ADOS. I love helping children with autism. I don't want to do assessment at this point. I do know that if I did assessment, I would be doing assessments all the live long day and I want to be treating clients. 
But eventually I would love for my practice to have a clinician who could do the ADOS so that we could help get proper um, diagnoses for autism. One of the reasons I love the ADOS is it involves 10 structured interactions with the child and the therapist rating uh, the child based on how they uh, complete each interaction. It is the only psychological assessment where the clinician gets to eat cake. And any uh, assessment that involves for cake eating, I am all about. And so yet one more benefit of the ADOS. It also allows for bubbles. So you have cake and bubbles. What more of an assessment do you need? Um, you know, the psychologist will generally um, conduct uh, a thorough history with the parents. Because in addition to having the ADOS done, you have to find signs of developmental delay before the age of three, which is one of the reasons why diagnosing uh, autism for adolescents and or adults is so difficult because if you do not have documentation of developmental delay before the age of three, you can't reasonably make the diagnosis. Um, so the, um, that, that is why these um, um, early uh, that's why get, getting this diagnosis done early and being able to, where you can have access to the records is so essential. Okay. The, uh, in addition, the parents will complete several rating scales, and there's a lot of great uh, rating scales out there. Hi, Jessica. It's you are listening to my web uh, Facebook Live now. This is a strange turn of events. And anyway. So the, um, the uh, psychologist will try to do an IQ test or an achievement test. Sometimes this can be done. Sometimes this cannot be done. One of the things that happened when Caitlin uh, started doing her IQ test, she just threw the blocks at the therapist. You know, really the therapist had it coming. Um, so there will also be an evaluation done by a physician, including evaluation, ideally, by a occupational therapist, a physical therapist, and a speech therapist to rule out any other underlying conditions. And then that will allow for the diagnosis of autism um, to be valid. One of the things that is unfortunate is that places that do not do the ADOS, do not do lead testing or hearing testing or get consultations with physicians or other professionals and just put the autism diagnosis on there, it may or may not be valid. I all the time have clients that come to me and I'm told, Josh, you really need to see them. They're autistic. And they come in, and within five minutes, I'm like, they're not autistic. <laughs> That's not the problem. Because there's a lot of other things from a psychological standpoint that you would also want to rule out. You would want to rule out reactive attachment disorder or ADHD or trauma. So all of these things you would consider. Um, so one, another problem that happens is let's say you have a child who is newly diagnosed with autism. Well, one of the first th places you would turn is to the school system. And in this area, uh, in the, the major counties here in Southern Indiana and Kentucky, they have developmental preschools and they are essential. I love them. They are wonderful and children can uh, start attending them as young as three years old and they're wonderful. Um, 
Now, Caitlin, when she was diagnosed, got the best testing that was available, and yet the school still will insist on doing their own testing. So, hello, Brian. It's good to see you. I am so much cuter on a camera than you. And so the... Um, so you're going to count on the um, uh, school uh, one, doing their own testing. That's just going to happen no matter where you got the kid tested. And that's just part of the deal. So the school will do their testing, and then they will determine whether the child meets criterion to go into the developmental preschool. Well, if accurate testing wasn't done at the beginning – then it will be identified in the school's testing that we have a problem and the child does, is not accurately autistic and uh, um, the, uh, the child is not ac actually autistic and does not need to go to the developmental preschool. Now, the beautiful Emily Smith has asked, wh where should a parent start if they have a concern? The start is with your pediatrician. And one of the best decisions that you can make for your child early in the process is choose a great pediatrician. <clears throat> we see uh, Dr. Bowl, uh, and he is amazing. Uh, I love that man. He uh, talked to my wife for over an hour after the office closed when she was concerned about Caitlin and has had a consistent and active interest in our children. I love the man. Definitely start with your pediatrician. Um, okay, so, oh, Nick, also, one of the things that will come up if you receive a diagnosis of autism is that you may want to apply for disability for this child so that they can get necessary financial resources that they might need. If that hasn't accurately been done, then the child will not qualify for the disability because um, uh, the child will also have more than likely more than likely have to undergo independent evaluation from people contracted out from disability, uh, physicians, uh, psychiatric and psychological uh, evaluations. Uh, so occasionally they will look at just the medical records, but that is rare. So yet again, uh, another reason why accurate assessment is necessary. So, um, I think the most important things uh, to remember uh, on this topic is, first, if you have a concern, talk to your pediatrician. Get assessment done early. I um, have seen that there are some people who have a stigma against autism that they think that there is something wrong with children who are autistic. I think children who are autistic are hilarious. They say and do things that are hilarious every day and they just crack me up. And uh, so for example, today uh, during Scouts, uh, my son Jared patted my stomach and he said uh, uh, he said daddy I can see you've been gaining weight how about we lose 10 pounds <laughs> just he's the best it just cracks me up uh, to begin the testing uh, Brian uh, a child has to at least be 18 months for accurate testing to occur. Um, so uh, you could it, now, if you see if you start to have a concern, uh, you can uh, already get the child involved in speech or PT or any other things. 
Um, but the uh, actual diagnosis can't really happen until at least 18 months. Now, uh, there are wonderful places in Louisville uh, to uh, have testing done. Uh, the U of L School of Autism is solid. Edelson and Associates is solid. Um, and those would be my uh, two places I would go first. In Indiana, it's dicey. Um, Riley's Children's Hospital does not take Medicaid anymore, which is a downer because this uh, um, is uh, it, it's the best testing to get done. Um, there, uh, there's Southern Indiana uh, Rehab, uh, which uh, will do some testing, and they do take Medicaid. Uh, and then there, I would, to tell you the truth, in Indiana, if you're on Medicaid, I would recommend traveling to a facility in Indianapolis is what I would recommend. My dear wife also recommended First Steps for Intervention because that is home-based services <coughs> that can offer speech and OT and developmental therapy um, in the home, and that can be invaluable. And, um, you know, we had a lot of success uh, with my uh, youngest uh, son who is not autistic, but was having a heck of a time learning how to walk, and First Steps did an amazing job with him. Okay, so we uh, those are a lot of the thoughts that I have about assessment in general. Let me get to a big elephant in the room, and let's talk about Asperger's disorder. Now, I don't agree with this. I don't like it, but I don't make the rules. In the newest uh, DSM-5, uh, DSM stands for uh, Diagnostic uh, Statistical Manual. It's how we uh, diagnose people with mental health conditions. It's the psychologist Bible. They have taken away the diagnosis of Asperger's disorder. Um, so people who pre have their previous uh, diagnosis of uh, Asperger's disorder still have that diagnosis, but nobody is receiving new diagnosis of Asperger's disorder. So if you see somebody and they tell you, yeah, my kid was just diagnosed with Asperger's disorder, either they were wrong or they got bad testing done. Okay, so, let's see, uh, from my favorite Shram, Jessica Shram, uh, what about kids that are not diagnosed with autism but on the spectrum, such a borderline? Yes, so, so we're talking a little bit about this Asperger situation. Currently, the terminology used is high-functioning autism spectrum disorder. Now, I don't like this at all uh, because, for one, I work with a lot of autistic people. Um, I have worked with a lot of autistic people. I have interacted with a lot of autistic people. And even my own two autistic children, and they are all incredibly different. My, my two children are incredibly different in their manifestation of autism spectrum disorder. And I really feel like it would be beneficial uh, for there to be a um, more clear distinctions about levels of autism. Okay, this is from my favorite Australian, William Waters. What would you say about assessment for high VCI, BRI? Yes, there is uh, uh, those kind of uh, assessments. You can do early assessments for... Um, uh, high-functioning autism, and you can get more compliance with the IQ and achievement testing. And interestingly enough, and I always find this fascinating, individuals 
with high functioning autism spectrum disorder, what we would call Asperger's disorder, um, are have a higher verbal IQ than typically developing children. So uh, it's a little feather in their cap. Uh, let's see. Okay, so, um, so like I said, if you have received previous testing that was done uh, two or three years ago or more, then you it is it is quite possible that uh, an individual has the diagnosis of an Asperger's disorder. And they can, they will keep that diagnosis, but there are no new uh, cases of Asperger's disorder. Um, now, some people like saying Asperger's disorder because they feel like it takes a little bit less of the stigma away from uh, autism spectrum disorder. For me, I don't really care. Uh, my son, Jared, has high functioning autism spectrum disorder. He goes to regular classes. He gets good grades. Uh, he um, his social skills could use a little bit improve, of improvement. But I mean, look at his father. I mean, <laughs> genetically, he didn't have, he didn't stand much of a chance. And so, other than that, uh, he he does well. So whether he has high functioning uh, autism spectrum disorder or an Asperger's disorder. What I like to focus in on are the behaviors of concern and what are the underlying issues. Because no matter what is, uh, where the child is, is on the spectrum, there are going to be some behaviors that are an issue. And so let's look at those behaviors. And uh, so because I have seen people who are very high functioning on autism spectrum and they are very articulate and they uh, have, they, they can show decent social skills, but they've also shown the ability to hit me in the face. So, <laughs> which I classify as a poor social skill, but that's just me. Uh, I also don't like being spit on. Also, personal preference. Um, so sometimes we can get a little hung up on diagnoses and not so much on behaviors. There are some other kinds of developmental disorders and uh, they are extremely rare. Um, and so rare that I haven't seen them in my work with individuals with developmental disorders. Um, Rett's disorder, which is predominantly found in females, and uh, that is uh, severe impaired developmental functioning. Um, childhood disintegrative disorder, which sounds horrible to me, uh, involves a normal childhood development for up to five years, and then the child losing that development, uh, which sounds like the worst kind of hell. Um, now, anyone who knows uh, my wife and I know that we um, love to hear the sounds of our own voice. We love to talk. I've been talking on this video for 40 minutes. I'm doing fine. In fact, I'm really enjoying this. I have a very smooth voice. I, you know, I mean, I know Roger Conley's good on the radio, but really I am great on radio uh, if I had a chance. But anyway, uh, my wife and I love to talk. And um, I knew things were bad um, when uh, Caitlin was diagnosed with autism. And as we were driving down to, home from Indianapolis, neither of us said a word for two hours. That's not like us. And for parents whose child uh, has been diagnosed with autism, it can trigger a grief response. Uh, because it, 
I know we're not supposed to do it, but it's just so tempting when you're holding that little baby in your arms, you're thinking about uh, walking her down the aisle on her wedding day. You're thinking about her graduating from college, having a family of her own. And, and then you're realizing that those dreams may not happen. And uh, that, that is a grief. That is a, that is a loss. And um, I definitely feel like parents should be given voice for that. Uh, it is not uncommon for the parents of uh, the children that I work with to come to therapy on their own to deal with that grief response. Well, I talked about a lot of things today. Uh, I hope that w this has been helpful. If anybody has a question, uh, that I about assessment that I haven't gotten to, feel free to type it in now so I can get it into you. I do want you to know that I relinquish all rights to this and every other Wednesday video. Feel free to share it with whoever you want. The important thing is this information gets out, uh, that people are aware and learn all they can about autism because it it is growing and it's there are more and more children diagnosed with autism each day and it is essential that we have an accurate understanding of what's going on and what's not going on um so uh also if you have it if you want to message me uh later with any other questions or thoughts uh feel free you're beautiful uh now in honor of my good friend Gonzalo, uh, who requested a song, I will sing uh, the national song of Chile. Si te vas para Chile, donde vives mi amor. I like that. Uh, more songs to come next Wednesday at nine. Uh, talk to you later. Bye.